Praise the Lord. Uh, so we're starting a new series, uh, which we flow into May, and I think in the month of May, uh, we deal with um, parenting and all the other things. I mean, we live in a world that things have changed. Things have changed. And this morning, as I laid this foundation, uh, in the last five decades, four to five decades, which means in the last 40 to 50 years, a uh, new definition has come into our world concerning God, concerning the family unit. And this morning, by God's grace, I, I laid the foundation. I titled this God and the Family. God and the Family. What is the perspective of God uh, towards the family unit? We may have many definitions. We may have many narratives pushed to us in these last four to five decades uh, through movies, through books, through uh, influencers. Uh, there are many things people have said. He said there are many devices in the heart of man. But he says, nevertheless, the counsel of God shall stand sure. I use uh, an unusual verse of scripture or passage to illustrate my message this morning. But at the end, you will understand um, the connection. Luke chapter 5, we read the first 11 verses. Luke chapter 5. We just read the first 11 verses. Luke chapter 5. Said, and it came to pass, so it was, as the multitude pressed about him to hear the word of God, that he stood by the lake of Gennesaret, and saw two boats standing by the lake. But the fishermen had gone from them, and they were washing their nets. Then he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's. And he asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the multitude from the boat. When he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your net for a catch. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish, and their net was breaking. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knee, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who are with him were astonished at the cash of fish which they had taken. So also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid from now on. You will catch men. Verse 11. So they had brought their boats to the land. They forsook all to follow him. They forsook all. To follow him. So like I said earlier on. That the past four decades. Witnessed a tremendous. And wide ranging change. In the family institution of our societies. These changes. Ranges, ranges. From. The present growing number of divorce rates. The birth out of wedlock children. The absence of fathers in homes. Same sex marriages. Cohabitation of people without a marriage contract. And even our Western society have been typified as the high divorce rate society. Cohabitation has increased eightfold or eight times since 1970 in most cultures. However, the biblical perspective not only offers us a clear indication of a healthy family life, but also include the believer's mindset in their own family life so that we can serve as the remedy for the damage caused by this new trend. In Romans chapter 12, verses 1 to 3 from the message translation, 
Romans chapter 12, verses 1 to 3 from the message translation. He says, so here is what I want you to do. God helping you. So the world may have given us a narrative about the family institution. Paul was writing about the renewing of our minds. And he emphasized it here that if God help us, we must learn to take our everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. So that includes our families. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing we can do for him. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God and you will be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly responding to it all of the culture around you always dragging you down to his level of immaturity. But God brings the best out of you by developing well-formed maturity in you. Verse 3 said, I am speaking to you out of deep gratitude for all that God has given me. And especially as I have responsibilities in relation to you. Living then, as every one of you does, in pure grace. It is important that you do not misinterpret yourself as people who are bringing this goodness to God. No. God brings it all to you. The only accurate way to understand ourselves is by what God is and by what he does for us. Not by what we are. Marriage implied from God's perspective a deep spiritual triangular relationship between a man, a woman, and Christ. I take that definition again. Marriage is a deep spiritual triangular relationship between a man a woman and Christ. If you read Ephesians chapter 5 verses 21 to 33, I believe in the course of this series, we will break it down. It emphasizes that. So, kingdom marriages are more than a mere legal contract. Because marriage in the world system sometimes can be Tag as a contract. It's a Hallelujah. Marriage in most of our cult culture is tagged as a contract. But marriage, from God's perspective, it's not a contract. It is a covenant relationship between the man and his wife before God. It's a covenant between God and his people. You know, we are faced with a rapid declining system, family system, where the two-parent family system is no more a common vogue. We have a steady rise in both teenage pregnancy and abortions. There is a large spread of HIV infections vociferous gay activism and widespread confusion about the legal and social limit of pornography and obscenity. You know, there is something, I, I, I'm just, please follow me this morning. There is something that 
directly or indirectly, is affecting the family. As much as it sounds good because of civilization and development that comes with it, is the concept of globalization. Just follow me. It has impacted so much on the family unit. The rise in activism, the rise in the messages of humanism, the rise in the messages of inclusion. But I think, or I believe, not just that I think, I believe that you and I, believers in Christ, must begin to stand a place in the larger society. And when it comes to the family institution, the only way is that you and I make up our minds to build our own homes so that it becomes a model home for the rapidly declining issues in our society. Can I have an amen this morning? As we speak, most people, mass marriages in our world are just in survivor mode. People are just holding on. Most couples are just going through the motion of just getting married and staying married. But I believe that this pattern can be re reversed. Most people are just holding on instead of building healthy families. Most people just want to stay married for the sake of getting married because of societal pressure. But I believe God has something better, stronger, that when we build on his template, we can be a model. You know, why am I so passionate about this? SEOC is passionate about helping people to achieve stable families. And so, this year, the teachings this year, I want to open our perspective to this. Please, you can build a model home for our society. You can be the living example of a marriage in this society. You can be the voice of the Lord in the midst of the things that are going wrong in our society. Do you know that presently, it takes more preparation and testing to get a driver's license than a marriage license. In some other society, you can just drive in into a place. By the time you are driving out, you have your marriage certificate. Do you realize that people invest time in preparing for a career, learning a new skill, developing their talent, yet they often marry believing it will just come successful. No, it doesn't work that way. The question this morning as we begin this series is that who teaches us how to succeed in marriage? Where do we go to find out? Or we are just surviving in it? Or just allowing each day, each chapter to just open? I don't think that's the best of God for us. I don't believe that is the best of God. I believe God wants us to thrive in our marriages. I believe God wants each and every one of us to build healthy families. Where do we go? I believe it's always the best thing to go back to the source. And the question is, who created marriage? Nollywood. Bollywood, Hollywood, who created marriage? Who determined the narrative that we must follow? I believe God created marriage. I believe when our homes are strong, our churches will be stronger, and our society will grow stronger and better. I believe that when we engage the biblical principles, 
it will equip us to walk in the fullness of that one flesh relationship that the Bible prescribed for us or prescribed for us. I believe that our homes will be the light and salt, ministering salvation, healing, restoration, and deliverance to other homes who are struggling. Kingdom marriages are built on the principle of God's word, which is our final authority and guide in all relationships matter. I want to share with us five thoughts about God and the family this day. Number one thought, God established marriage as a heterosexual monogamous institution. That's the first thing that we must understand. God established marriage as a heterosexual monogamous institution. It doesn't matter the narrative. Even the people in our society, in our larger society, we call them the conservative. They don't even understand this, but they know that marriage is an exclusive relationship between one man and one woman. And if you and I are going to make success out of our marriages, out of our relationship, we must have that mindset. Marriage, as God established it, is our heterosexual monogamous institution. And God doesn't leave himself without a witness. There is a board. It's called pigeon. It's married to a spouse, one pair for life. If that pair dies, it stays single for the rest of its life. You can do your research. So marriage is an exclusive relationship between one man and one woman. So, you may say, but polygamy was a custom in the Old Testament. Yes, Lamech started it, Genesis 4.19. You can research it. Genesis 4.19. Then Esau repeated it in Genesis 26.34. Abraham, David, Solomon. Those are descriptive things. But for you and I, we must stay with creational order. When God started marriage, it is between a man and a woman. Those men in the Old Testament, what they did was situational and descriptive. After the fall of man. That's why when Jesus was reinstating things in the New Testament, in Matthew 19, he said, in the beginning, it was not so. So, the New Testament space that we must operate in. Can you please help me? 1 Corinthians 7, 2. Because everything is, is back at that creation order. Please give me in the NLT. NLT. Maybe subsequently, just NLT. But because there is so much sexual immorality, each man should have what? That's the New Testament. Each man should what? Please respond. Or are you planning to do another one? No, respond to me. And each woman... So, marriage, Jesus repeated it in the New Testament, is between a man and a woman. In Titus chapter 2, verse 4, NLT 2, said the older women must train the younger women to love what? And they are what? So, it's individual. Every man must have his wife, and every woman must have what? A husband. 
So that's the first thought. It's an heterosexual monogamous institution. The creation order is one man, one woman. And let me touch on this. Same-sex marriage. The New Testament, I know it's also in the Old Testament. Men sleeping with men, women sleeping with women. But in the New Testament order, you can read Romans chapter 1 verses 21 to 32. What happened? He said, yes, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship him as God. They even gave him tongues and they began to think up foolish ideas of what God was like. As a result, their mind became dark and confused. Claiming to be wise, they instead became utter fools. And instead of worshipping the glorious ever-living God, they worship Adam, made to look like mere people, and birds and animals and reptiles. So God abandoned them to do whatever shameful their hearts desires. And as a result, they divide, degraded things with each other's body. They treated the truth about God for a lie. They worship and serve the things God created instead of the creator himself, who is worthy of eternal praise. Amen. That's why God abandoned them to their shameful desire. Even the women turn against the natural way to have sex and instead indulge in sex with each other. And the men, instead of the, having the normal sexual relationship with women, born with lust for each other. Men do shameful things with other men. And as a result of this sin, they suffer within themselves the penalty they describe. Creation order. There is nothing like same-sex marriage. Descriptive. In the last five decades, that's where we have it. That's the first thought. Marriage is a heterosexual, monogamous institution. Secondly, the purpose of marriage is primarily for mutual help and guidance. The purpose, God's idea about it is primarily, it was his prerogative, Genesis 2.18. It is not good that this man should be alone. So, it's primarily for mutual help and guidance, physical and spiritual fulfillment. Physical and spiritual fulfillment. Even though, let me say it today, from the eyes of God, procreation is synonymous with marriage. Please understand, a childless marriage is not inferior before God. It's not. But a blessing, a blessing, a blessing. I know, I know people who decide not to have children, yet they are happily married. So, that descriptive, the culture says if you don't have children, then you are not good in marriage. No. In the eyes of God, the purpose is for mutual help and guidance. I know it may be something that many people find it because culture, there is a way the culture has invaded our perspective. And I can break down some of those culture, but that's, today is not the day. Sometimes they say that, oh, if a woman, if a marriage does not have children, it's the fault of the women. But we have since found out, even through medical means, that sometimes the fault may largely be by whatever is happening to the man. As much as children are good, but please, let's also understand that in the mind of God, a marriage without children is not an inferior one. Thirdly, the marital relationship is an intense relation on the spiritual and physical terrain. The marital relationship is an intense relationship on both the spiritual and physical terrain. Most of the time, people place emphasis on the physical, but it's on both, it's first spiritual, then physical. Husband and wife become one flesh. And it simply suggests that these two people are sharing each other's life. 
in a complete and dedicated manner. Marriage is more than sex. Marriage implies a deep spiritual relationship, a triangular one between a man, a woman, and God, or Christ. Marriage is a covenant. Marriage is a covenant between a man, his wife, before God. It is characterized by permanency, sacredness, intimacy, exclusiveness, and mutuality. So, taking a woman or taking a man as husband involved promises and duty towards God and accountability towards each other. So marital relationship is an intense relationship. I know we have sex spies up our relationship, but hey, and I know that people say, oh, that's one of the reasons. Yes, but beyond the act of intimacy through sex, marriage is an intense relationship. It's a covenant relationship between the man, his wife, before God. Even in the Old Testament, or even up till now, in some culture, a woman is expected to be a virgin. Because, you see, the eye height of any covenant relationship is the shedding of the blood. So when the penis on the wedding line, in most cultures, in some of those cultures, what they do is that they spread a white bed sheet. So the family of the bride... Who is giving them to the family of the man? They stay in a place. They hang around. So when the man goes into his wife, the introduction of the penis to the vagina, usually that first attempt comes with the shedding of the blood. And so in the morning, they wrap up that white bed sheet and they give it back to our family that now we are in a covenant relationship with your family. It is permanent. They don't return that white bedsheet. It's a permanent thing. And that act of intimacy before God, because I said to people, when you are having, if you are married and you are having sex, what do you think God is doing? Covering his eyes? No. No, it's, it's, it's a covenant it's a covenant relationship. As we go into this, it, it's a very deep thing that we must, because we need to define what marriage should be to this world. There are scripts that have been introduced to your children's cartoon. So, the covenant character, you see, we must have that time. We live and die here. We, of course, we touch on some things that militate against people's home. But that's the way, that's the attitude. God doesn't change his mind about the, your salvation, does he? No. The covenant. The covenant. He endures all things. It endures all things. It doesn't change. It is not conditional. If you say sorry, then I love you. So, taking a woman as wife or a man as husband involve promises and duty towards God. And then accountability towards another. That's, the, that, that's the, the fourth thing. Marriage grows out of love. Between husband and wife, it grows out of love. When I use the word love here, I'm talking about agape. Selfless love. So, love, that kind of love grow. Uh, filio is lost. Uh, um, what's the other one? The first level? Eros. Romantic love. It's temporary. 
But when we mention love from God's perspective, it's the highest one that we're talking about. The one that is kind, the one that is patient, the one that endures, the one that uh, suffers, the one that holds on. So, marriage grows out of love between husband and wife, and it is maintained by love and faithfulness. See, only God's love can make any one of us who is married to be compassionate. Only. Only. Only God's love can make us to be caring. Only. Only God's love can help us to be committed to our spouse. Only. Only God's love can help us to be self-denying. Only. Only God's love can help us to be self-sacrificing. Only. Only God's love can help us to forgive one another. Only. It's not feelings. It's not. So, you see, the reason why we are starting this way, so that we can understand what you and I have signed up into. It's a covenant. It's not a contract. For those of you in business, you know what it, a, a good contract means. A good contract, we always have an exit strategy. A good contract. We always, when people before they sign, they are looking at the exits. If this thing does not pay, how do I exit here? That's what a good contract is. If this thing will go into variation, how do I manage it? That's what a good contract. But a marriage in God's kingdom, it's a covenant relationship. And three people are involved, or three entities. The man, the woman, and then Christ, who is the head of the church. Understand, I can pull that out, but I'm not going to arrange marriages occurred in biblical history. But it's just descriptive. The, the creation of order is that a man eh, will look for a woman. That's the creation order. In the first order, eh, God brought the woman to the man. And so he named, even though it was brought to him, but he was the one who named. In the New Testament, which is still the creation order, what God does is parade the prospect. You make the decision because the first man says, the wife you gave me. So the New Testament order, he who finds You are not looking for a bad thing. I don't want to believe that. You are looking for a good thing. So you find and you take responsibility for what you find. I know we can stray and start to name. No, but the New Testament order, which is the creation order. That's why Jesus, we say in Matthew 19, he says, when those ones says, oh, for just simple reason, the, the meal is salty. They said, and all you just have to do in that culture is that to, you walk to the balcony and say and announce to the people, I've been warning you, this woman, you put too much salt in my soup. This is the first one. All you just have to do is to do three or other three or five. And then you come out, from today, I divorce you. I di you don't need to go to any court. It has entered into people's hearing. You have warned that woman three or four times. It is time to let her go. They did it for that woman at the well of Samaria to the point that he did not evolve. When Jesus came in contact, and that's where my test is, no matter the narrative, when we come in contact with Jesus, he can change that narrative for us. And that narrative can help us. We can call other people. Come and see what Jesus has done. The Bible says, Peter, call his companion. So we can build healthy homes. We can build healthy children. We can become better parents. And we can use that as a model to our generation. Can I have an amen today? Amen. That's number what? Four. Number five. Man and woman were created in the image of God. The 
the man and the woman. They are created in the image of God. You see, that singular understanding will help us in our relationship of marriage. When I acknowledge that I am created in the image of God, when I acknowledge that my spouse is created in the image of God, when I acknowledge my children, because it's extended, are created in the image of uh, likeness of God, so the issue of love, respect, mutual love, mutual love, mutual submission, mutual respect, mutual honor, it won't be something that we debate. Love is not rude. It's not, it's not something that we debate. So the image of God is found in human dignity. So when we are doing name calling, you are a witch, you are this, you are a wizard, you are... We are losing it gradually. When we allow the circumstances surrounding our issues to now play a hopper role than the word of God, we are losing it. We are losing it. We are losing it. So, man and woman were created in the image of God. In that image, that's where the dignity is. And in that dignity is the inherent goodness. That's why if you read Psalm 8, it tells us how God thinks about you and I. He said this, I mean, David was asking the question. He said, who is this mind, man, that your mind is full of him? He said, you created him and you have made him a little lower than yourself. Psalm 8. He said, you crown him with glory and honor. And so, if we are created in his image, that's what we need to reflect. When, my, when, when you meet anyone who is rude, is a put off. When you meet anyone who can respect, they can respect their spouses, they can respect their children, is a put off. When you meet people who can respect even their parents, it's a put off. Next week, we will we'll talk about it. How the environment we all grew up in has shaped our perspective. Your first father will probably shape your perspective as a father today. So, and what we are saying is that if you find that those narratives are not what it's supposed to do, then let's look into the word of God because he says that even when you don't have the natural father, he said, I will take you home. We can look at God and model his fatherhood and then we can use that in our marriages and then we become better fathers to our children. Can I have an amen this morning? Amen. That's why he takes God. He's a source, so he takes him. We need his help. We need his help. This project called marriage, we need his help. And the higher we all admit it, the better. And as we go through this series, please understand, if all you have done till now has not worked, eh? I said it yesterday, one of the definitions of insanity is to wanting to do the same thing over and over again and expect a different result. It's not going to work. It will not work. It will not. It will not. I agree. Some of us have been raised. And then you can't blame your friends because that's how they have also been raised. They cannot give what they don't have. Some fathers were not present. We can't fill them in that local government space. Some are present, but they are silent. And if you... If you trace your life up to now, next week we, we touch on it, it may likely be that you are tending towards that. We need to stop it and change that narrative. In closing today, that passage that we read, it's very important. God was the one who started the family unit. Genesis 2.18, it is not good. 
that the man should be alone. God says, I will make, I help meet someone who is suitable, who is adaptable, who is comparable. So that's the nature of God. And so Peter was one day going to fish. It was his skill, skillful at fishing. So a lot of the time, we are also skillful in our life careers. But sometimes, we get to a point where the skills don't work. It doesn't work across board. So this particular day, they toil all night, and they caught nothing. Nothing. I mean nothing. The women who came to buy, who usually come in the morning, they have waited for them, and they don't have things. And then all of a sudden, they toil all night. I mean, toiling can be also in this relationship matter. A lot of us, we are just confused. And I'm not exonerating myself. It takes the world to build a home. A lot of, they were confused. And so Jesus showed up. And that's what we are asking through this series. Jesus will be showing up in each of the teaching. And we need to yield to his instruction. You have toiled all night. You have caught nothing. You have toiled up till now. You have even borrowed vessels from your uncle, from your aunties, from your parents. You have borrowed vessels from your friends. It has not worked. But Jesus gave a command. He said, cast down your net for a catch. And he did. The Bible says the testimony was so great that he had to invite people. And that's what God is going to do with us, even at this time. Our homes will be restored. Our home will be rebuilt. That other people will want to come and partake of what Jesus has done in our lives. Can I have an amen? amen. Let's stand this morning. Let me just put it. Let's just pray for each other. Hold somebody's hand. Uh, 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 you may not know their story. You may not know their, their experiences. Just hold their hands. That the Lord Jesus will... will, will, will we give them a war this week. There is a need for all, every one of us to make adjustments. Can we just pray for one another? He said, pray for one another that we may be healed. I don't have prayer point. Just pray for your brother. Pray for your sister this morning. Whatever it is, the Lord Jesus meet them at the point of their needs. They are healed in the name of the Lord Jesus. Some of us, we are carrying the hurt, the pain of the past. We don't even know sometimes when we react. When we react in our relationship, we don't know why. But it may be something that locked between, in between us. But Lord, this morning, thank you for pouring out your spirit upon every heart, for pouring out your heart of healing, of restoration. Thank you, Father Lord. Manta Paso to the Dekizada do do Kishke da da da. Ye kala he appoint unto them who mourn in Zion beauty for their ashes, the oil of joy for their mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness that they may be glorified. Lord, we say thank you this morning. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the perspective that you are going to give us through this series about you and what you have in mind for our families, Lord. You are the head of our own family in the kingdom family. And so thank you because our hearts are open to ye to your instruction. Thank you for your blessing. Thank you for your grace. It is sufficient for us. I pray for my brothers, for my sister. Everyone require healing in any area. The Lord, you pour forth the balm. You are the balm of Gilead. You pour it forth over every wound where words have been spoken, where actions have been misconstrued. Lord, thank you for healing and restoration. We give you praise, worship, and glory. For we pray with thanksgiving in Jesus' precious name. God bless you. We continue the series. Uh, let me also announce that on Wednesday, what will we do with the Wednesday? We just teach for some few minutes, and then we do question and answer in the area that we will address and touch. God bless you. Enjoy your week in Jesus' name. Amen.